we live in a community that is surrounded with a variety of denominational churches. We are all familiar with many of the denominations that are in every community in this country. There are also many community churches. These community church churches claim to be non-denominational, when in fact they're really multi-denominational. They try not to offend anyone of any faith. They sort of meld all their doctrines into something that everybody can accept. They don't get too strong on Calvinism to offend the Baptists. They have a certain amount of charismatic involvement in the so-called spiritual gifts in order to appease all the Pentecostals. Even the Episcopalians or Presbyterians, they can all feel, probably the Mormons, you know, maybe as well, feel comfortable in these community churches. You know, years ago, maybe even still to some extent, I've always thought that I would rather live in an area where there are a lot of churches like that. Where you have people who at least believe in God, and many of whom honor Jesus Christ. But yet, there's a lot of false teaching being done in these churches. The fact that they're there with people who claim to be Christians, and in many respects, live as Christians, uh, that's good for our safety, I think, for the well-being of the community. It's a lot better than being in a community where there's nothing but atheists. And people who may even uh, fulfill the implications of the atheism by uh, persecuting Christians. And we see that going on in places around our country. So in one respect, I think it's good to be surrounded by people in all these different churches because of that. But they're also being taught in these churches doctrines that are not true. They're being taught things that are not true, but they're also not being taught things which they need in order to have their soul saved, or things they need in order to remain faithful. And that's serious as well. So I'm not really sure what the best thing option would be. To live in a community where there's other churches, where Christians, where people are trying to live according to God's word, morally, upright? Or is it better to live in a place where there's no churches teaching false doctrine? Where people are not being kept away from the truth? I guess that's something we'll have to struggle with individually. But I'd like to turn your attention to a subject that uh, we're going to be discussing today. The title of the lesson is For the Remission of Sins. And you are as well aware as I am of where this comes from in the New Testament. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Peter told the crowd there, he preached this gospel sermon concerning the deity of Jesus Christ. The fact that Jesus Christ was the Messiah prophesied in the Old Testament. And it's through him that we have our sins forgiven. And when these people, having heard his sermon, said, Men and brethren, what should we do? Because he accused them of having crucified Christ. And he said, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So we're going to be looking at this phrase in just a moment, for the remission of sins, taken from this comment that Peter made here in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. But before I get into that, I want to notice some of those false teaching things that we referred to a moment ago that come from modern religious teaching. Things that are preached from modern religious pulpits around our country, be they the denominational churches or the community churches, whatever they might be. Because there's a lot of false teaching going on out there. And we're going to notice as the lesson uh, progresses that a lot of it has to do with this phrase for the remission of sin. First of all, what's being taught in many churches today is that denominationalism is good in God's eyes. What I have indicated here in this context, as you can see, that denominationalism really implies division. I don't think that's the definition. It might be one definition of denominationalism or denomination. I and mean, we see denominations particularly as a reference indirectly to different divisions of the whole. 
So denominationalism really implies division. And many people teach that that's good in God's eyes. But take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, which says, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and there, there be no divisions among you that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. These folks here in Corinth, as 1 Corinthians chapter 1 points out, some are following after Paul. Some are following after Apollos. Some are following after Cephas or Peter. Some, of course, are following after Christ. And he said, you cannot be divided like this. God is not the author of this type of division. You all need to be following Christ. Then he asked some rhetorical, rhetorical question to emphasize this point. You know, uh, was Paul crucified for you? Was Peter or Apollos crucified for you? Were you uh, saved by the blood of Paul or Cephas or Apollos? No. We're saved by the blood of Christ. And there should be no divisions within God's family in terms of who we follow. So we see that division in the denominational world. People follow different churches with different names, with different doctrines, with different founding uh, fathers, different... Uh, Founding structures. We see division is right. But yet many people say that's okay. Division like that, denominationalism is good in God's eye. We also learn from modern religious teaching that Jesus is the vine and denominations are the branches. We know this goes back to John chapter 15 and verse 6 where Jesus is teaching a lesson of the importance of unity and remaining in him, a Christian needs to be unified with Jesus, must remain in him. He says there in verse 6, If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. You can read the entire context there, John chapter 1, 15, verses 1 through 8. But here he's talking to individuals. These are, Jesus is, of course, the, the vine, that we must abide in him as branches. But the branches are not denominations, they're not different churches, they're individuals. Look at the uh, words used here. If anyone is not dividing me, he is cast out as a branch and is with it. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. He's speaking of individuals that must abide in Christ. The individuals here that would follow Christ are the branches that must abide in him. He's not talking about denominations. There in John chapter 15 verses 1 through 8. A third modern religious teaching that we hear very commonly taught is that people in all churches will go to heaven. Is that true? Do you believe that people in every church, regardless of its name, or what they teach, what they practice, uh, are we all going to go to heaven? Are we all going to heaven just by different paths, so to speak? Matthew 7, 21 and 22 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many he will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied or taught in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And Jesus says in verse 22, which for some reason did not end up on my uh, overhead here, he said, Depart from me. You workers of iniquity, for I never knew you. Those who simply say we're following Christ, but don't follow him, are not going to be accepted by him. Again, Matthew chapter 7, and verse 21. And I'll read it this time to make sure I quoted it correctly. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, be who does the will of my Father in that. If then there's preaching and teaching, Proclaiming, oh, I believe in Jesus, I love Jesus, Jesus this, Jesus that, Jesus everything, that's good. Jesus is everything. But we must do more than say that we're following Jesus. Or teach that Jesus must be followed. We need to follow Jesus, do what he says. Also, a fourth religious teaching that's very common, very popular among denominations that we all know about is that salvation is by faith alone. But all we have to do is express our faith in Jesus, believe in Him, and we'll be saved. Interestingly and ironically, 
The only time in the whole New Testament that the word faith alone is used, the phrase faith alone, is in James chapter 2 where it says faith alone is dead. Faith alone will not save you. Five times in James chapter 2, the passage says, What does it profit, my brethren, in verse 14, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? Well, the rhetorical, uh, the answer to that rhetorical question is no. Verse 17, thus also, faith by itself, it does not have works, is dead. Verse 20, but do you want to know, a foolish man, that faith without works is dead? <coughs> Verse 24, you see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. A man is justified by obedience. Not just saying that he believes in Jesus, but obeying Jesus, performing works of obedience. In the same context, the writer James points out that the demons also believe and tremble. But yet they're not going to be saved. That reference to the demons believing is a point that's very strong in making the case that belief alone is not going to save. It's not going to save demons because they certainly are not going to obey Jesus. Even though they believe in Jesus, they know that Jesus exists. They don't believe him in the sense that they're going to dedicate their lives to him and obey him, but they believe that he exists. But they're not going to be saved. Then verse 24. You see then that a man is justified by works, not by faith only. And then finally, verse 26, For as a body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So we are taught in these verses that faith alone is a doctrine that is not taught in the Bible. Just the opposite is taught. Faith alone is dead. Faith alone will not save. Another doctrine that's very popular among denominational people is that uh, you can be saved by offering the sinner's prayer. You can be saved by asking Jesus into your heart. You can be saved by a personal relationship with Jesus. And that's taught everywhere, all the time. In reference to people being taught how to, how to be saved. All you have to do is offer the sinner's prayer. I don't know exactly what the sinner's prayer is, but basically it is. If you've ever heard of Billy Graham uh, sermon or uh, many denominational people you hear on the radio all the time, they talk about the sinner's prayer. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner, or uh, let me in, or allow me to put you into my heart and save me. Those are not the exact words. I meant to look it up and it's like quoting exactly. But that's basically offering a prayer to God to, for salvation. Or people say, just establish a personal relationship with Jesus. You know, none of these phrases are used anywhere in the New Testament. They're not found there. You know, the inspired writer said that we could be saved by offering the sinner's prayer, or by asking Jesus into our hearts, or by simply establishing a personal relationship with Jesus. It would be there somewhere. But they're not in there. They're not in the scriptures. Nowhere is anybody in the New Testament told to be saved. Refer back to Acts 2.38. When these people said to Peter, they asked him, what must we do? He did not say, just offer the sinner's prayer. He didn't say, just ask Jesus into your heart. He didn't say, just establish a personal relationship to Jesus and you'll be saved. No, he said, repent. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sin. So this idea of the sinner's prayer, asking Jesus into your heart, these things are not even found in the scriptures. So I wouldn't put my faith in it, and I wouldn't encourage anybody else to put their faith in that type of advice in terms of going to heaven. Now should we pray to God? Certainly we should. Should Jesus be in our hearts? Definitely. He has to be in our heart. I don't see how we can be saved without Jesus in our hearts, in our lives, and all we do. Should we have a personal relationship with Christ. Yeah, we certainly should. That should be a part of our life as a Christian. But that's only a part of how we are saved. And nobody in the New Testament was ever told to do any of these things initially in order to obtain salvation. Another religious doctrine that's very popular that we all are familiar with is join the church of your choice. You know, I've seen this on the back of uh, trailers going down the highway 
uh, Worship God Sunday in the church of your choice. I'm sure you've probably seen them too. And this is a common bit of advice that people are given. Uh, in almost any denomination, they don't care really what church you worship in, just so you worship somewhere. It's their uh, theology. Join the church of your choice. But is that good advice? Does the Bible say join the church of your choice? What does the Bible say about what church ought to be our choice? Take a look at Matthew 16, verse 18, where Jesus said, And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against me. Now he was talking to Peter. The other apostles were there as well. And when he said, You are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, he was talking about building his church upon Peter. He was talking about building his church upon the confession that Peter gave in verse 17, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That was the rock upon which Jesus built his church, that he is indeed Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That was the rock, bedrock foundation upon which the church was built. That's what Jesus' ministry was all about, proving that he was the Son of God. <laughs> he came to this earth to save people from their sins, and he said, I will build my church. We ought to consider, when we're going about joining the church, what church is Jesus talking about here? How do we identify which church is his? If Jesus built the church, that's the one I want to join. That's going to be my choice. So I need to be busy finding out what church that is. Because that's the one that the gates of hell are not going to prevail against. All these other churches, are you taking a chance and putting your eternal soul in peril? Acts 2 verse 47 says, There after Peter's sermon that we talked about in verse 38, Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So it says the Lord here was adding to the church. These people were not saved and then decided what church to join. They were, when they obeyed Peter's command to repent and be baptized, the Lord added them to the church. Now I know you can join individual local congregations, like I can move away from Chester here and move up to Indianapolis somewhere and there might be a dozen different faithful churches. I can join myself to either of those local churches. But in terms of what overall church I want to be in, does that include the denominations? Whatever church Jesus built, that's what I want to identify with. And that's the one that the Lord's going to add me to. So I want to make sure when it comes to following the Bible I follow what the Bible says, not what some preacher tells me if he's not establishing what he says by the Bible. I know the testimonies from a lot of people who talk to non denominational preachers about uh, questions they have. How to become a Christian? You know, is baptism something I need? They give answers that are not necessarily from the scripture. They give what their tradition is. They give answers based upon their uh, uh, creed books and so forth. Not necessarily what the Bible says. So joining the church of your choice, nobody's ever given that advice in the Word of God. There's only one church we need to be concerned about, and that church is that which is established by Jesus. And then finally, along these lines, a common uh, falsehood that we see preached and hear preached in denominations is that baptism is an outward sign of an inward grace. What they mean by baptism is an outward sign of the inward grace. It's a physical thing we do to show that we are saved. The idea of grace here is a reference to salvation. So baptism, they say, is a physical sign that we go through in order to show that we're already saved, is what they mean. And as somebody has very clearly said, in reference to the Baptist church at least, it's easier to get into heaven than it is to join the Baptist church. Because you're baptized into the Baptist church. In order to be saved, what you got to do is believe. But if you want to be a member of the local Baptist church, you have to be baptized, and they vote on you. I guess they still do that. And then you're accepted. So they say it's easier to go to heaven than it is going to the Baptist church. But anyway, they teach that baptism is an outward sign of something you already have. Is that what the Bible teaches? Look at 1 Peter 3 21. Does it call baptism an outward sign of inward grace? There is also an anti -type. This is in contrast to the uh, 
ark that uh, was raised up above destruction by the flood in the days of Noah. There is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism. And it identifies the point that baptism or immersion in, in water is not the removal of the flat filth of the flesh. And we're not taking a bath. That's not what baptism is. But it's the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus. And what does that mean? Baptism saves us. That's really said enough right there. And what is baptism? It's not being physically clean. It's not the removal of the filth of the flesh. But it is the answer of a good conscience. What does that mean? When somebody hears the word of God taught, and it's explained to them that you are a sinner, all of sin that falls short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. And you respond to that saying, what must I do to be saved? And then you obey that, you're told to repent and be baptized. Well, if you've got a good conscience, you will be obedient. You will be, you'll repent of your sins, you can confess the name of Christ, as one passage says, and be baptized into the body of Christ. So the baptism is the answer of good conscience. If you've got a clear conscience, you want to keep your conscience clear toward God. Once you hear the word and you obey it, you've done what you need to do. Your conscience will be clear. And all that is accomplished through the power of the resurrection of Jesus. That we have uh, the forgiveness of our sins, eternal life, by the fact that Jesus, who is a chief cornerstone, who is proven to be the Messiah by virtue of the resurrection from the dead. So the resurrection is a foundation on all that we do if we seek to be obedient to God. Then again, Mark 16, 15 says, And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Does this sound like the baptism is the outward sign of an inward grace? No, this says baptism, along with belief, is necessary for salvation. Can't be saved without it. So baptism comes before salvation, not afterwards. So let's keep in mind all this modern religious teaching that goes contrary to the Word of God. And that last point I made will serve as a segue into the remainder of my lesson today. Well, they say that baptism is an outward sign of an inward grace. Well, I want to go back to Acts 2.38 and take another look at this. Where Peter said, then Peter said to them, who asked men and brethren, what must we do? He said, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now we're going to zero in on the title of the lesson. We wondered when I was going to get back to that. For the remission of sins. Well, this phrase, for the remission of sins, is interpreted and explained differently by different people. Those people who teach that baptism is not necessary for the forgiveness of sins have a different interpretation. I think an unscriptural interpretation of this phrase for the remission of sin. And it goes down to the very word for here in Acts 2.38. The word for is a preposition in English or the word ace is a corresponding preposition in Greek. Some people pronounce it ice. I pronounce it ace. I've had a little bit of a Greek background and uh, I'm sort of like a Homer Haley, who one time said he was a professor of mine in college, he said he knew a little Greek. He ran a, a tailor shop in Chicago. And I'm probably in the same category. I know a little Greek enough to make me think. But the word ace or ice, another joke about this is that if you contact a uh, Baptist preacher and talk to him about this word, this preposition ice, he'll just Skate around on it for a while and then try to get rid of it. Skate around on the ice, so to speak. But nevertheless, I pronounce it ace, so be that as it may. But it means into, unto, towards, entrance into, and it denotes direction, according to Thayer's Greek lexicon. But the denominational people teach something different about what this word means, at least here in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. They teach that the word, preposition 4, 
does not mean into, unto, towards, and it's into, or denotes direction. They say it means because of. They think that the word for in this context means because of. And the word Peter is saying, repent, let every one of you be baptized because of the remission of sin. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But the Greek preposition ace is never translated because of in the New Testament. Never translated because of in the New Testament. So if you go to a local Baptist church and they talk to you about baptism and you say, uh, what about Acts 2.38? It says they had to be baptized for the, they had to repent and be baptized for the remission of sin. And they say, well, that word there means because of. So you are baptized because of the remission of sin. But that's not what the Bible teaches. This word is translated 1,000, I think, 471 some odd times in the New Testament. The word ace is found that many times. It's translated into, to, unto, in, for, on, toward, that, against, upon, among, or concerning. Because of, zero time. Never is the word ace in the New Testament translated because of. Unless you talk to a denominational preacher, who does not believe that baptism is necessary, you know, for salvation. Because of the remission of sin is what they teach. And that, I don't think that makes any sense at all. Getting back to uh, Acts 2 and verse 38. If you take a look at, uh, before we get into the denominal, denominational error there, look at Acts 2 38 in your own Bible for a moment. And you see there that the word for the remission of sins follows after the commands to repent and be baptized. The words repent and be baptized are equal in terms of their uh, position in this verse. Acts 2.38 says, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sin. If the word for there means because of, thus eliminating the need to be baptized in order to receive the remission of sins, then it also eliminates the need to repent. The command to repent and baptize go right along together. They're of equal weight in the context. So if you're going to say, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus because of the remission of sins, you're eliminating more than you really want to as a Baptist. Because they certainly teach you have to repent of your sins. So they are eliminating more. This verse proves more than they want it to prove. It proves too much by half, as the old saying goes. So if you're going to eliminate for the remission of sins, and that call it because of the remission of sins, so you're going to have to be baptized, then you're eliminating repent as well. And that proves too much even for a Baptist. But let's continue on in reference to this denominational error, where for means because of instead of uh, unto or, or uh, looking forward to the remission of sins, and they interpret this, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ because of the remission of sins. I think we've explained this from another perspective as well, I'll point out the truth, that this word for does not mean because of, it doesn't make any sense in the, even in Acts 2.38. But compare this with Matthew 26 and verse 28, which uses the same word within the same type of a context. Acts 2.38 says, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 26, verse 28, Jesus says, and as he establishes the Lord's Supper, For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. Jesus says, My blood is shed for the remission of sin. Did Jesus say that my blood is shed because of the remission of sins? If Jesus said that my blood is shed because of the remission of sins, then why did he shed his blood? If he shed his blood for something that's already happened. So it doesn't make sense in this case to interpret it because of, and it doesn't make sense in Acts 2.38 to interpret the word for 
because of. But Jesus did not shed his blood because the remission of sins had already taken place. So compare Acts 2 38 with Matthew 26 28 in your own time and look into it maybe a little more deeply. But Acts 2 38 and Matthew 26 28 possess the same identical Greek phrase. Applying the because of translation in Acts 2 38 mandates that the translator also apply it to Matthew 26 to verse 28. The absurdity of the argument then becomes clear. Because the argument makes Christ's death on the cross unnecessary and futile. So I think with just a simple reasoning, we can come to the conclusion that this particular denominational error is indeed not taught in the Word of God. That we have to be baptized, we have to repent in order to be saved for the remission of sin. And we cannot misinterpret that because of, but many people have. Many people just accept the person's word for it without digging into the scriptures themselves. But we all need to be readers and studiers of the word of God. Give diligence to show yourself a worker that he's not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Be like those in Berea who are more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they search the scriptures daily to see whether the things that were being taught were true. We need to be Bible searchers, looking into the scriptures, studying or giving diligence to show ourselves a workman that he's not to be ashamed, rightly dividing and rightly understanding the Word of God. We have the responsibility uh, of understanding the Word of God. Give it to us as if it's a command in, in a, uh, in a uh, Galatians or the, I think, Ephesians 5 verse 17. Understand what the will of God is. It's almost given to us as if it's a command to understand the Bible. So we cannot depend on what some preacher, not even what I say. You study for yourself, and you find out what the truth is. Then furthermore and finally, the argument that men and women can be saved without baptism is a lie. Should be, is a lie. That's the essence of our lesson. How do we retain the forgiveness of sin? For the forgiveness of sin, repent and that I want you to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Baptism is necessary. And people use that mistranslation and a false interpretation of Acts 2.38 to prove that baptism is not necessary, along with other arguments, but I think the Bible teaches just the opposite. So the argument that men and women can be saved without baptism is a lie. It's not found in the scriptures. It originates with the father of lies who was a murderer from the very beginning and in whom there is no truth. And that's talking about Satan himself. And many people teach the doctrines of Satan when they teach things that are contrary to the Word of God. If you're among our number this morning, and you're not a Christian, if you have not repented of your sins, if you've not been baptized in the body of Jesus Christ, you're not saved. It's as simple as that. Baptism, just like repentance, comes before salvation. Acts chapter 8, talks about the Ethiopian eunuch confessed Jesus. And we're told by Jesus in Matthew 10, uh, 38, if you confess me before man, I will confess you before my Father is in heaven. So we need to repent of our sins, be willing to confess Jesus among men, be baptized into his body in order to be saved. If you need to do that this morning, we encourage you to come forward while the song is being led. We have baptismal robes, we have a baptism that's filled up and warm. We encourage you to come if you need salvation. As together we stand and as we sing.